So I'm Patrick LeBlanc. I'm Bradley Ball. Yeah. And Brad works on the, and so we were in the speaker room. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's kind of sad because I work at Microsoft and I had no idea what this CXP was. And so I was like, Brad, can you tell me? Nobody knows what, uh, <laughs> what this is and how do we get engaged? So I, I asked him to put this here because if I don't know about it, I don't think most people do. And so yeah. can you tell people? So I work on the Azure Fast Track team, a CXP, and it's called customer experience, right? Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that we are a complementary service. If you're moving to Azure, if you've got a migration, if you're doing anything, if you're doing a modernization, you, if you got a CSA or you're working with a partner, you can have them nominate us. Matter of fact, if you go to that link right up there, aka.ms slash FTA, that will take you to a landing page about us, and there's a nomination form to be able to get engaged with us. And we have a scope, a project basis, but it's a complementary service. These are all the different services we cover. Wow. I am on one team. I'm on a data and AI team. We have an app team. We have a networking team. We have, uh, in the US, a federal team. But we're also in 22 different countries. We have an EMEA team. We have an APAC team. So I guarantee wherever you are from, there is a fast track team that can help wow. you with some facet of what you're working with. Wow. Wow. Our, and our goal is just to help you have a better customer experience. Because we all know when you start to use the cloud, there's a little bit of a learning curve to be able to get in there and begin to use it. And our goal is to help you get past that learning curve so you can just start running as quick as possible. And so anyone can use this link, internal, external, oh, yeah. internal to Microsoft, external to Microsoft. Absolutely. Now, to nominate, you have to be a partner. You have to be somebody internal to Microsoft who has access. That's why a CSA or a partner oh, could do it. OK. But, wow. Yeah. I, didn't know, I didn't know about this. Did anybody know about this? See? No? Oh, yeah. oh well, hey, there we go. We got one. Adam, Out of, you know about that? See? Uh, See? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, all right, so data's everywhere. Okay, so this is my first, uh, the, okay, we're starting out, we we're got data. Out. Data's everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. we're, getting, we're getting a zettabytes worth of data. You can collect it. That's a massive amount of data. It, they literally just had to invent that number to be able to be like, this is how much data we're invent. gonna have in 2030. We, we made up a new. A new number, we're making up new numbers, y'all. Yeah. I, so, I don't know why they went straight to Z, right? Maybe you start a little higher on the alphabet. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, because... Yeah, I didn't think about that. But it's everywhere. By 2025, we're going to have zettabytes of data, you know, mm -hmm. from IoT to log, time series. Data's everywhere. And now we're going to find out what it is, right? We're, we're going to find out what the service is. And right. So here we go. This is the... So to, to manage that type of data, internally at Microsoft, we created this thing a long time ago. Okay, right? okay. Okay. And it's so great that we decided we're going to start sharing it with the world. Gotcha. Okay, you got it? Yeah. So most people have never heard of this service. Most people have never heard of this most service. Most powerful service. Most powerful service. So okay. I'm going to give you a hint. Okay. First hint I'm going to give you, it stores data in a columnar format. Can you describe a columnar format so, a little more for me? You know a table. Yeah. Table's got rows and columns. But what's great about this is it stores each column individually, right? I got, I got this. Okay. I got this. I know exactly what this is. Tell this me. is on a... Big beefy VM, I've got SQL Server 22 because it's got column store indexes and we can process terabytes of data. Bam, SQL Server 2022. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna give you another hint. Okay. The data is a distributed architecture. Okay. So data on RAM and it also uses SSDs. I got this one okay. because what you're saying here is the compute and the storage are separated. And We've got SSD, which is ridiculously fast, right? Yeah. SSD operates in microseconds. Your old spinning disk, they, they were milliseconds. And then we've got memory, which is hundreds of nanoseconds. Our CPUs are super fast. If you, if you saw Connor Cunningham's talk earlier in the week, he talked about the SQL operating system and the architecture and why understanding the chipset was so important. And that's because the, the memory, the, the operations in the CPUs happen in single of nanoseconds, memory's hundreds. How fast is a nanosecond, right? I keep saying that. By the time I finish this sentence, one billion nanoseconds have occurred. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot of processing time. I know exactly what this is. This is Azure SQL Managed Instance, because we've got a column star database in there. It's got, we're on premium SKU because it's business critical. It's SSD. We can handle up to 16 terabytes of data. Bam! No, you, you, you're wrong. Okay. I'll give you another hint. Okay. So this has two cluster types. Oh, you don't even have to say anything more. I got this. I got this. Okay, because okay, we got compute optimized yep. and we have memory optimized because you might have two different logical processing workloads that you have to go through. And, and this is going to be great for data science type of operations. We're talking Spark here, baby. We're talking about Spark clusters because we got memory optimized, we got compute optimized, and we're talking about Synapse, analytics, Spark clusters. Bam. Oh, 
No. You're wrong again. Okay. I'll give you some more hints. I'll give you some more okay. hints. It's fully managed, okay. it's high performance, and it does big data analytics. Oh, I should have seen this from the beginning. Okay, I got you, I got you. Fully managed, high performance, our compute, we got SSDs, storage, memory columnar format, big data analytics platform. This is Azure Snaps Analytics, dedicated pools, boom. Nope, no. that's not it. A few more hints. Okay. So, it's in a node cluster, it's new. and we scale by adding more nodes. And I think we can add it up to about 1,000 nodes on this. This thing. is a Microsoft product, right? Yeah. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Microsoft okay. product, yeah. I got you, I got you, okay. <laughs> we scale horizontally, right? Yeah. Okay, okay, we scale horizontally, we got these compute nodes. Does it auto-pause? Auto-pause, yeah, auto-scale yeah, up, auto-scale down, yeah. vertically pause, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ooh, I got it. Because we redesigned the architecture and the operating system for this thing, and we built it internally. It is absolutely fantastic. It's one of my favorite systems, and I do a deep dive on this sometimes. We're talking about serverless no, SQL no, pools. No, no, and no, 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 no. You just, I, I thought you were like the CXP engineer architect that did Azure. I don't Oh, I don't know, I'm starting, to question the, I'm starting to question these things. Right, we can scale horizontally. We have predictive, we have reactive, we have custom. I mean, this thing looks at what you're doing and it just scales out on its own. I, I mean, it sounds like the most amazing thing in the yeah, world. It's pretty what, amazing. What, so what do we got here? Azure Data Explorer. Azure Data Explorer. Wait, this is Cousteau, right? Cousteau. How many of you have heard of Cousteau? Right, and join the, there's so many tweets and things going out about Cousteau, I don't know how you, Okay, so wait a second. So what you're telling me is Cousteau is separated, yep. CPU and the compute, the yep. storage is sitting on SSD. We yep. can scale to thousands of nodes. Yep. How many nodes? A thousand nodes? A thousand, I think. I think a thousand. Don't, don't, don't quote me on that. Well, I, I was gonna say, up. and we, we can scale this like physical hardware. So, I mean, we're talking a lot of potential CPUs. Yeah. If you have a thousand nodes and that many CPUs, somebody from an Azure data center either hates you or they're buying you a Probably. Christmas card. Probably. One of, one of the two. Right. And so, tell them about some benchmarks. There. Okay, so when we look at Data Explorer in and of itself, yep. I don't know if you knew this. You probably knew this, because you, you knew what it was. Yeah, You'd I actually did. read the deck beforehand. It outperformed Google BigQuery and Snowflake. I mean, because everybody's talking about Snowflake and how fast Snowflake is, right? Yeah. Uh, 19 test queries with a single user. And then we went, let's ratchet it up, right? 19 to 18 queries, 18 to with concurrent queries also yep. happening, outperform Snowflake and BigQuery again. Yep. yep. And then look at that, look at how fast this is. This is under one second that it's processing all of this stuff. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. It's pretty good. Wow. And so you go into Azure, the portal, you can search for Kusto or you can say, search for Azure Data Explorer and then you can set this thing up. And you, there's some configuration options. The one thing that really got me excited about it was it auto stops. It's like Spark, right? You can, you know, if you, spend, if you have a Spark cluster, you can say, hey, after 15 minutes of idle time, shut down. This thing can do that. It's like serverless pools. It saves you so much money because when you aren't running this, when you're, you're not, not paying it, for compute. You're not paying for it, right? Mm. Um, it has auto scale. So it'll automatically scale out to meet the needs of what you're doing at that time. It so, can actually scale vertically also. Um, but we're just gonna talk about horizontal today. Okay. Yep. And does everybody know what we mean when we say vertical scaling? Yep. Raise your hand if you don't know and you want an explanation. God, so many hands. Oh no, a couple hands went up. Okay, so a vertical scale up is when I add more CPU cores, more memory to an instance. So vertical is I go up, horizontal is I scale out with additional machines. And so when we talk about vertical, we can provision this and, and you can provision it with, I, I wanna say like 50, 60 cores, the maximum number of cores. I remember looking this up before, you can have over 1.1 million cores. 1.1 million cores. It's a lot of data, though. I'm guessing you're making, working with a lot of data. If I know, right? That's, that's a lot of stuff. Well, zettabytes. I mean, zettabytes. Zet zettabytes. Yeah. But it's a proven technology. We've yeah. been using this technology internally at Microsoft for years, but now we have lots of other people that's using this technology. I know. Yeah. All look, right. look at all those folks. That's lots of them. You want to go back? No, yeah, sure. I, I, I mean, because it's not just us using it, right? I mean, look, we've got a lot of stuff that is running on this, yeah. but we also have a lot of customers outside of us who are doing this. The thing is, I don't think nearly enough people know about this to understand how they can use this. So has anybody used Kusto? Yeah. Did anybody say it's really difficult and I don't want to use it anymore? Oh, I got a couple hands. I got a couple hands. Okay. It was too difficult. Yeah. 
<laughs> I, I might have something a little later, but I we'll think, have to check maybe, that out. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. And so this is Cousteau by the numbers. Look at the amount of data that's ingested daily, 112 petabytes. I can't even fathom how much that is. I mean, one YouTube song is like three megabytes. And so that means if we were to do this in like YouTube songs, it would be... <laughs> It'd be a lot. Yeah, be a I'd lot. have to take off my shoes. <laughs> yeah, do a lot of counting, right? Okay, so here's the situation. There is a group, I think they're out in Israel, and there was a session in, uh, there was a session I was doing, and I was doing some work. I, I needed to look at some telemetry data for Power BI to do some digging. I wanted to find out who was the most frustrated user, who's getting the most errors in Power BI. Adam? So, was it, was it Adam? Probably was Adam. Yeah. And so uh, I reached out to him. It was like, ah, oh, we got all the telemetry data in Cousteau. I was like, but what is this Cousteau thing? And she was like, oh, let me show you. So she went through this demo and she was doing all these great things. And I was like, well, can I have access to that data? Um, and one of the things we talked about was we capture all the Power BI telemetry data in Cousteau. So think about the volume of telemetry data. It is really good for these two scenarios, log and telemetry data, but there's other great scenarios for Cousteau, really great scenarios. But this is the one I wanted to focus on today. Let me what? show you, where's my mouse? Let me show you this demo. So she gave me access. I'm gonna watch the demo if you don't mind. Okay, she gave me access to this, uh, this environment and this is basically the Azure Data Explorer. There's a client tool that you can download also and connect up to your, your instance. But let me show you what she gave me access to. So I got connected to this server and I'm gonna run this query right here. So when I run this query, what you're gonna see is, this is just some metadata about my tables, but look at this. This is the size, the original size of this data was you know 24, uh, it was really is that, big. Is that a trillion? Yeah, yeah. And the, then the extent size, but then look at the compression ratio. So we brought it down almost 10 times when we ingested it in the Custo and put it in this column, the format. It's pretty ridiculous. impressive. And so the table that I'm really interested in is this BI Azure trace, because this is where all of our telemetry data for Power BI is collected. And so I said, well, let me see how many rows. Let me, let me see how many rows is in this data. So I'm just gonna do a count. It's really simple to do a count on this. I'm gonna run this. And now, so take a look. Take a look at this, Brad. I want you to take a look at this. I'm gonna zoom in so you really can look at that number. That's, a, that's 40 billion, right, with a B? 40 billion rows. Did you see how fast I ran that query? And we, and we aren't recording this. I mean, some people would think it would be live to this is not record recording. demos on Azure. Not your, you know. <laughs> 40 billion rows a day. I ran a count, 40 billion rows. Now watch this, so I'm like, all right, I need to get some information about this. So let's find. Well, and Pat, real quick, before you hit the next one, right? It says done, and it says 0.339 seconds. So it did, and you're not hitting a cluster in the UK. We're hitting something yeah. on the East Coast of America, right. and, and it over, was sub-second. Over this great internet that I'm connecting to, this wonderful internet Wi -Fi. I'm connected to. So I'm gonna run this, and I'm gonna do some aggregations. I wanna do some counts by these different levels, because this is gonna show me, you know, this, a single day aggregate of all my trace records over 24 hours. So I'm gonna do this, and look at that. Look how fast that query came back. Man, you remember what query in your colors? You're so fancy, look at that. We're querying lots and lots and lots. We're talking about trillions and trillions of rows of data. So can your snowflake do this? Probably no. not. No, it can't, right? It can't do this. So I'm gonna show one more demo, Brad. I'm just trying to give you a sense of how, how great this is. That's all I wanna do. So to find, the, to find Adam in here, because Adam is probably the person who complains about Power BI the most, especially since she's moved into management, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna run this query. Watch this. I ran over those 40 tri trillion rows, of billion rows of data. There's my pickiest user. I anonymized Adam's GUID, but you can see that first one is that's associated to his speed, so I didn't want anybody to know the other people, but the first one wow. is technically Adam. And he logged on that particular day 3,000 errors to Power BI. I have no idea what he was doing, but uh, there. So what do you think? That is amazing. Okay, so it's, uh, it's one more super thing. ridiculous. One more thing oh, before yeah, you take over. Yeah. And so I, I just tinkered a little bit with Power BI. Just a little bit, and I want to show you this. You can't imagine that I imported this. No, no. Oh, I mean, so I wanted to show you how fast I can, I connected to Power BI with this thing, and I put these little, the task names, because yeah. I wanted to see how many errors were associated to this. So when I initially load the report, so let's open up Performance Analyzer. 
So I'm gonna go here, turn on performance analyzer. And so I'm gonna clear the report cache, right? This is just gonna clear the data from the report cache. So let's see how long this takes to run this count from Power BI yeah. over the internet down the Kusto. Let's go ahead and refresh this. Cool. So uh, it's pretty fast, right, to do Whoa. the count. So now I'm just gonna select one of these, right? Send in that query pretty fast over that volume of data, right? That volume of data. So it, wow. it does the query. Now my machine locked up again. Uh, oh, there we go, switch. And so you can see how quick this is, sending these live queries back to Kusto and just doing quick counts. But I mean, it's, the aggregations, they work, it's just that fast. So let me ask, at, at this point in time, does anybody find that useful to be able to have big volumes of data that you could ingest and you could read so fast? Yeah. Okay, I see some hands going up. But you did all this in KQL, right? Yeah, it's just, hey, Patrick, it's just the syntax. I'm a SQL guy. Like my, my Twitter handle is SQL Balls. I'm, I'm a SQL guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I write DAX and SQL. Okay. If I can learn KQL, you can learn KQL. But what if I don't want to learn K well, KQL, but I still want to use this? I don't. I got nothing for you. I got something I can't for help you, you with I, that. I got something for you. Am I? Which one am I? Number one. Okay. All right, here we go. So. This, this is SSMS, right? Everybody knows SSMS. How many people here can write a SQL query? Okay, I see every hand up in this auditorium. That means you can write KQL. Uh, did you know there is a command that will actually explain KQL? Uh, and, and it's gonna take SQL and, and it's gonna write it for you. So Bob Ward, everybody knows Bob Ward, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. So Bob Ward and I, I I've got this data set it's from re retrosheets.org. It's a free data set for baseball. Um, again, US sport. And he and I were having a conversation. It goes from 1920, uh, 1921 to 2016. It stops at 2016 because I'm a Cubs fan and that's the last time we won the World Series and we're probably not likely to do it again for another 100 years. And so it just, it <laughs> stops for me at 2016. Um, but I, I was talking to him and I said, you know, triple plays happen and he wanted to know what baseball team had the most triple plays. And so I thought, oh, well, I can, I can find this out in my data set. So if I come over here, actually, I'm, I'm going to start out in Azure Data Explorer. I'm just going to say explain, right? I've, I've got this baseball stats table right here. And, and this is exactly what I've got sitting on my data lake. This is what I've got, and I'm able to consume it. As a matter of fact, let's just say I want to I show you what the data looks like. So I'm going to say select top one all from baseball stats. There we go. I'm gonna run this. Sweet. And you write in SQL. Yeah, and so uh, it gives me this data back in a row. Now I'm just gonna highlight this. I'm gonna say run. Boom, there we go. Can everybody here copy and paste from a cell? Yeah, I, I can too, right? I, I don't need to learn KQL. But this is my data right here, and you can see I've got a game ID. It's, it's basically broken up by a couple of things. So I, I've got, this is by the Texas Rangers, so TEX, and then I've got uh, the year 1994, 06. This is going to be the month, June. It's on the 13th day, and that's zero. It's a zero, it's a one, it's a two. It, it means it's, is this game a doubleheader? A doubleheader is when we play two games back to back with the same team in the same stadium in the same day. If it was a doubleheader, it would either say one or two to let me know which one it is. So there's some information in here. I got the teams, I got outs, I've got all this good stuff. So what I want to do is I want to take this because I looked at what Bob said and we had a deeper conversation. He said, I want to know what team has the most. He goes, and then I want to know, is it for or against? Because that's pretty important, right? If I have a triple play that I execute against somebody, that means I got all of them out and the innings just over. If I had a triple play done against me, that's bad, of course, because I was out. So what I did was I created uh, a temp table and I took everything from, and I wanted to get home and away game information. I put it in two temp tables. I then union those two temp tables together. Uh, and let me just show you this first one, it, for example. Give me all the different triple plays. So I'm gonna take this statement right here All right, and it gives me a KQL statement. Now, it's not always perfect, but it does a really good job most of the time, right? So here we go. This is the total number of triple plays against that data set that have occurred for different teams. And you can see, I've, I've got a team code right here. 
Pittsburgh uh, Pirates, it looks like they've had the most triple plays occur, but I, I don't really know what the context for this is. And the thing to know is I've got a line for every game, but that it's based off of the home team. Well, there's a home and a visiting team. So I have to abstract this into a home team and an away team. And, and that's why I need that temp table to union that together so I can get a true count. I'm gonna go over to Azure Snaps Analytics Workspace where I've actually got a KQ Engine set up. We've got it in preview and I've got this sitting already over here. And so what I did was, uh, I already showed you this one, the distinct number of triple plays. Well, what I wanted to do was get the triple plays uh, for a team and I had a case statement. I wanna make sure that you see this. When I ran this, I wanna insert this into a temporary table I come over here, and just so you know, you need to do explain for right now in Azure Data Explorer, that's not yet in uh, the Synapse portion, but you can create KQL over here, and then you can run it. This has one slight error. This string null right here just needs to be two quotes. Sorry, I erased one of these. And then I can run this and I've got all my teams and I've got by the year and I've got home and against. I need, to, I need to, to get this for home, I need to get this for away and then I need to aggregate this. So let me go over here to snaps and I'm gonna do that. So how do I create a table? It's not that complicated. I just do set and then I'm gonna do tp underscore home, set temp home, right? And mm -hmm. then it's that same query. So here's home. And if it spins for a second, I probably should have checked that my Synapse was connected before this. Nope, it, there we go, it worked. And so let me do a quick select from there. And by the way, I didn't write this as KQL. I went over and I went select star from, so that way I could understand what do the rows look like. There's my data and I've got it in my temp table. So I also need to do this for the away games. I'm gonna run this over here. I'm not gonna make you look at those results though because what I want you to do is I want you to know I took that C SQL union statement and I had it produce it right here too. TP home, TP away, there's a union, there's a distinct, but again, I didn't need to know how to make the KQL, it made it for me. So I take those union results and I throw them in a temp table. Hmm. And then let's select this so that way I can see that was actually populated. There we go. I got my teams, my play location, verdict for or against, a game year, the number of triple plays. I'm ready to start aggregating. So I said, what, what is the total number per team? Because now I've got home and away. Now I can understand what is the right number. And it hurts my heart because I'm a Chicago Cubs fan. And that's their code up at the top. The Chicago Cubs have had 45 total triple plays. Jeez. Um, next, next is, yeah, well, we don't know that yet, okay. right? So. Um, Next is Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh had 37, so it, it was up there with 23. The next thing I wanna know is, I could look at this, I could say, let me see by home and away. And again, I can see here's home and away. Now it looks like there's a ratio potentially here because the Cubs have total 28 home and away, which means if, if we're sitting up in the 40s, we've got a little less when we're at home. Um, I don't know whether that's good or bad yet, so and again, I've got that right over here, and all I did to get those results, I taped, copied and pasted this T-SQL, generated this KQL, and then I could take a look and I could see, oh, thank God, the Chicago Cubs have 24 for them. They have executed 24 triple plays on other teams. Wow. Now, sadly, looking down on the list, they've had 21 executed against them, but we are slightly above 50%. I can't say that for many things as a Cubs fan. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy triple plays are working out pretty good. But I can see, so the uh, Philadelphia Phillies, they've had 23 against them. The Chicago White Sox have had 21 against them. And you can see we're sorted by numbers, which means their ratio is going to be negative if we keep looking at that. Pretty cool stuff, right? Pretty cool stuff, pretty cool stuff. All right. So does anybody like the fact that you don't have to learn to write KQL, you can just use your T-SQL? Yeah? All right, excellent. So one more thing. Yep. You're a Power BI guy. I am. I, 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 I know you like Power BI. I do. So I, I wanted to make sure. I think sure way it too. <laughs> to be able to show you something. Yeah. So I took my baseball data sets yeah. and I put it together and I used KQL to be able to load this up. 
Because you see, here's my premise. There, here's my problem. I live in Orlando, Florida. Big Chicago Cubs fan. We've established that. Yep. Chicago's about, it's it's long flight. It's yep. like a five, five and a half hour flight from yep. Orlando to be able to get to Chicago. Yep. Um, I got a wife. I got four kids. Four kids. Yeah, so it's going to be a lot of money for me to take people to go see a Cubs game. I would prefer to go see a game when my team is going to win, right? I, that's a good thing. Everybody, I mean, it, it can be a good time at the park if, you're, if yeah. the team loses, yeah. but, but I'd prefer to see them win. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to know, could I use the historical aggregations to be able to take a look and determine when I should actually attend and maybe who I should attend? So this data goes all the way back to 2019. Uh, 21. 21. So it's a lot of data. Yeah. It's going to load up. Let me... Minimize a little bit of this, so that way I can make this as big as possible. Does that look good? Yeah, that looks good for y'all. Okay, so you can see I did a little bit of extra work. I, I separated some of the data out by if they had a winning record or a losing record, because I really wanted to be able to understand that could impact the, the win-loss ratio that we've got. And I'm sitting here down at 1920, and I'm going to take this up to the modern baseball era, let's say about 1996. There we go. I'll just stop right there. Pretty cool. Pretty fast, right? Pretty fast. Yeah. And you're direct, this is direct query. Yep. And so now I'm going to come over here. I'm going to select the Chicago Cubs. I want to go to a game at Wrigley Field, so I'm going to select home. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to aggregate this looking at the wins that we have against particular teams. Now, if I look at these percentages, I can see Thursday, I've got a 63% chance of seeing them win if we have a winning record. Um, if we have a losing record, it looks like Wednesday... I've got a 41% chance. Friday, I've got a 42% chance if we've got a losing record. Yep. But there's some particular teams that I actually do better against. And it looks like looking at these symbols, I know this is interleague baseball play. Yep. So when the Cubs are playing at home against an American League team, they have a better probability of winning. So if I know it's interleague play and it's on, say, a Thursday with a winning record, or if it's on Wednesday with a losing record, or actually Friday, that's when I should buy my tickets for my, me and my family to go it's see the Cubs. cheaper. Yeah, probably. It, oh. And I could probably get a better deal if I'm watching a game on a Thursday than if I'm doing it over the weekend. Yeah, flights are cheaper, hotels. How about you? What's your team? Uh, Atlanta Braves. Atlanta Braves? Okay. So if we take the Atlanta Braves, and let's say you want to see them at home, it looks like on Monday you've got a 69% chance of getting a win if they are above 500. Um, let's see, 64% on Saturday. 66% on Tuesday. So yeah, we, we, we want to go to a Monday game. Yep. Um, and it looks like, again, interleague play. If they're playing the Chicago White Sox, they win 100% of the time. Yeah. So We'll see the White Sox. White Sox on a Monday for Atlanta. Yeah, awesome, awesome. All right, let's go back to the slides. Yep. Any questions? Any questions? What's a triple play? What's a triple play? <laughs> That's a good All question. right. So a triple play. <laughs> Great it, question. <laughs> in baseball, there's a first base, a second base, and a third base. Somebody hits the ball, a runner advances to first. The goal is for them to round the bases and be able to get home and be able to score. And that's how we increment the score. In the instance of an out, you can throw it and you tag the base before they get there or you tag the player. <laughs> for a triple play, you get three outs and the players don't get a bat anymore. So you get three outs consecutively, and it's a very rare thing to occur. Um, as, as you can see, it doesn't happen, even going all the way back to the 1920s up to 2023, right? We're over 100 years. We don't have 100 for any team. Uh, so it means that one team got all three of the other players. They had zero, they got all three of them out, and they have changed the inning all at once. Good question. <laughs> Probably should have explained that up front. <laughs> Does anybody have questions I, about I, I hope that makes a little more sense. <laughs> My bad? Does anybody have questions? Yes, we. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, so as a columnar storage, which was some, something that I like, the first time I ever experienced that was back with like the bird effect and things like that, but when that was unveiled, I mean, how much of like, I guess, shared like underpinning do they have? I have no idea. I have no idea. Yeah, so uh, the question was, uh, his first experience with columnar compression was with the Vertiprac uh, engine back on Azure SQL, uh, well, with SQL uh, when it was introduced, and also Power BI and Tabular Analysis Services. Uh, how similar are those two engines? I'll be honest, I have not discussed that. That's I don't know question. what, yeah, I don't, I don't know. We'll it's out. a great question, I'll we'll find, find out. out, but I, I don't know how close that algorithm is. I'll find out. We've got one on, on the screen, actually. Oh. Can you use explain in log analytics? Well, so I, 
so the explain, what's interesting about the explain is, and Brad, you keep me true, but I, I did a little reading about it when you showed it to me. Yeah. And so you need to have a similar type of structure in SQL so you can write those queries and then you can take that query and do an explain. And log analytics is not in SQL, it's yeah. based on K KQL right now. Exactly, so log analytics is based on JSON. Right. Uh, we've got nested JSON, JSON values. The values that I utilized, I had actually uh, made as parquet values because it imported the data type and it also imported the columnar header. Now, could you use it? Yes, but what you've got to do is you've got to take those JSON logs, you've got to export them as potentially Parquet data, which you can do, and you could write them out to Data Lake using those multiple nodes and that CPU. Um, and then what you could do is you could ingest that and you could write T-SQL against it. Um, and that would not be a super, uh, doing an export and then doing an import, that's actually something that you could do. Uh, and you could do that via Azure Data Factory, that's not something you have to do utilizing uh, Cousteau. But it's not just, it just, uh, just doesn't work. You gotta do some stuff. Yeah, you're gonna have to do a transformation to yep. get there, but you could do that. Yep, more questions. Yep. Is there a difference between Power BI Desktop and the Power BI component in Synapse? Oh, oh, oh. Um, so what you, can do, what you can do in Synapse is just like the, the read-only view of what you get in Power BI. So looking at reports in the service, it's just the same. It just took that and wrapped it around in Synapse. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So the question was, this looks very powerful. Why would someone use this versus an, another tool? So there are certain things that this excels at, right? This is gonna auto scale up, this is auto scale down, this is going to do, just perform fantastically when I'm querying large amounts of data. Um, it, because it's columnar, if I'm doing some type of extrapolation, I'm gonna get more power over that data. Where you wouldn't necessarily look at this, this might not be the first place that I utilize as an ETL engine. It could scale up, it could scale down. The query uh, has some limitations in size of what the data set result set could be that it returns. Um, but because it's highly compressible, uh, you can get a lot of data out of that amount. But uh, that is something to keep in mind from a concurrency perspective. Uh, this is, and I mean, they're a competitor, right? But this is very much like Snowflake, where you, the way it works is the more nodes you have, the more uh, data can concurrent queries you can have. You could actually have up to over 100,000 concurrent queries on Cousteau if you wanted to on, on Data Explorer. Um, but again, somebody's gonna be sending you a thank you card because that's not cheap. But could you do it? Absolutely, you could do it. Um, but there's different places where these individual things shine, right? Um, Azure Serverless uh, Snaps Databases. We had some fun with this earlier, but um, one of the things that you can do is you can throw an indexing structure on ETL for dedicated pools. You can use Serverless to be able to ingest data Data, um, Delta, uh, do a cross database query against Parquet or CSV files. If you've got an externals table set up, utilizing T-SQL. Uh, part of this is going to be what are you comfortable utilizing this for? But if you need to retrieve large sets of analytics data log, um, if you're willing to do a couple transformations to be able to put it in Parquet, if, if SQL is your native language to get you over the hump to KQL, this is definitely something you should be looking at. Yeah. So the question was, where would I go into this versus utilizing Synapse? I think part of this is gonna depend on the transformations that I need to do inside of the data. I just made some temporary tables very quickly and very easily and I could turn around and I could drop those. Think of that more like how you would do something in Python or Pandas to be able to create a new data frame, put that in there and then retrieve that data in the format that I need it to be in. Where I would utilize Synapse, again, is large scale ETL processes. That's where a dedicated pool really, really shines. Um, we've done some things like including the query memory cache to be able to make sure that, um, uh, and the data, is, uh, data set result set caching that we've got sitting at the head node, the size of which depends on the scale of your cluster that you've got to be able to make it faster. But ETL really, really shines in a dedicated pool. Where a serverless pool really shines is giving you a T-SQL interface that auto scales up, auto scales down, pauses is super cheap, uh, but it does it over that data in your data lake without having to do an ingestion because I don't need any other ETL to occur. 
So for something like this, I typically already want my data to be ETL'd, and then I'm going to need to load it in. I can do that via Data Factory, but then I'm looking at probably high concurrency workloads and queries that I need to run, and that can scale up or down depending on what I'm doing. But it, but it gives you that capability to do, as you saw, sub-second queries on very large data sets to return analytical dashboards for Power BI. Yes, sir. I was going to say, it, it auto pauses. I mean, yeah, that's part of the auto scale. What, what's the minimum uh, time component? I would have to look at docs to give you that. I don't want to tell you a wrong answer, because I, I could very easily say something that's wrong based off of another service. But I would, need to, I would need to look at docs to be able to tell you what the minimum pause time is. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question was, what is the use case for using it in Synapse versus using it outside of Synapse? It's the exact same functionality with the exception of, like I said, right now, explain doesn't work uh, within the Synapse. But here's the thing, right? That was the same cluster I was connecting to in the Custo interface and also in the Synapse interface. I don't have to pick and choose. I provisioned that in Synapse. I accessed it in Data Explorer, um, and then I can go back over and use it in Synapse. So really, you, the main reason to use it in Synapse is maybe if you were using Azure DevOps to be able to take your KQL scripts and migrate them from one environment to another if you were calling them in some type of data pipeline. Um, but other than that, if you're just running ad hoc queries against it, uh, you could use it either just fine. But before the next question, so SQL Bits announcement. Due to the issues with the trains, we have decided to bring forward the prize raffles to the last break at 1540. So just to let everybody know. No, that's fantastic. Did everybody hear that? Because that's pretty important. Uh, due to the issues with the train <laughs> service and disruptions, they're bringing forward the prize raffle to 1540, which as an American makes me go 340 p.m. <laughs> so uh, 340 p.m., that's when the prize raffles will be. But what's great is, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, what you could do is you, you can define an external table on this. I, I did not do that in an example today, but you could build an external table, have a file where you land data, and you could query external uh, data with this. So in the real-time scenario, what you would do is you would land in a data lake, and you would just pull this in specifically. You would want to make sure that the format is going to be friendly for the way you want to do it. So again, if, if you wanted to use T-SQL to be able to create your KQL queries, your format can't be JSON, and it can't be nested JSON values. If you're OK writing the KQL, it can be those just fine. So the question is, do I have any information on real-time analytics specifically for uh, live ingestion? I don't have that right off the top of my head. I'd have to build something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting scenario. The way I would probably do it is I'd take the baseball data and I'd pump it out using an API either as, as like JSON or, or as something else and then figure out how I'm going to call that API and land it via a webhook or, or something like that and then begin querying it. Um, I think it's just going to... It, there's a lot of it depends. JSON could be super nested. I've, I've seen companies do this before where they have a very large JSON file and they have a million nesting items in it. Um, and in those particular cases, if you have to extract that, I'm sure that would be more complicated and have more overhead, but it, it would be an individual testing query behavior. I tell you, uh, we're about to wrap up, but I, there's a couple things I know you want to yeah. get to. Yeah. So yeah. you can start with Frito. So somebody asked about cost. Free. If you, my, favorite, my favorite price. Free. Free. And so if, no one, if you've never, you know, if you want to go try this out and kick the tires on it, you can go to this link and or scan that QR code, and you definitely can get a free cluster. I have my own that I've been learning uh, KQL on. And, but with the one thing she asked me, I'm talking about Svia, she's the GM, she's the manager for this, submit feedback. 
If you, you, know, you see stuff, if you have questions about it, submit the feedback. They're looking at the feedback and they, they would really like to get this feedback from us. You want, anything you want to add? Yep. Um, Wait, so, oh, the Custodia Detective Agency. This amazing. is one of my favorite games out there. If you do want to learn KQL, and I, I believe Guy in a Cube has a video on this, we right? We do. We yeah. do have a couple of, we have a video on it. We actually have some videos. We have videos with, um, I forget, Svia, Svia, um, where she actually talks about really good use cases. And like your question you had, if you can get that question to me, she would have the answer to it. We yeah. would get that answer to you. She would have all telemetry, all metrics, and anything about real time, anything. So if you just come to the booth, we'll head over to the booth after this, and I'll get your information, and uh, we'll get that question to her. And she'll be happy to answer it for you. She'll be excited to answer it. And so um, it's zero friction. It's only one person. It's a virtual cluster, and it's a really small cluster, but 100 gigs of data. I mean, it's, it's a good, good playground to have to go in. Yeah, I was uh, going to say that's more than enough. I mean, yeah. it's, I, I've got about 15 gigs of data within the baseball data set, yeah. and that was, that was plenty. And so it may auto-renew. She told me to say that. It may auto-renew. They haven't decided yet yeah. if after one year it will or will not auto-renew, but it may auto-renew. Right. Oh, hey, look at that. I, I got a YouTube show. Uh, I, I do got it with four other guys from uh, um, <laughs> from Azure Patrick. We we had this really handsome guy named uh, Patrick LeBlanc on. I think I guess. Uh, we also had Adam on as well. I, I should have put that on there, but I didn't know he was going to be sitting in the audience. I didn't think he was coming. I, did, I, I didn't told either. Told him not to come. Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Oh, and. Uh, yeah, this is our feedback link. Please give us uh, feedback so we know, was this a good session? Would you like to see it again? Do you want us to come back? Um, that helps SQL Bits yeah. know if we should <laughs> or not. And that's Tom Hanks, so thanks. Tom Hanks, thanks. All right.